So today I'll be talking about the BET analyzer housed in the metals core facility. Um, BET just stands for the abbreviation of the three last names of the researchers who came up with the mathematical equations that the BET analyzer runs on. Uh, the brand name of this particular instrument is Micromeritics, and there's a nice picture there of the analyzer on the right side and the sample dry down apparatus on the left side. So what does this instrument measure? It measures surface area and porosity of materials, solid materials, through the process of gas adsorption. If we look into what gas adsorption is, uh, think about kind of similar to surface tension. Materials have this surface energy, the atoms on the edges of them due to van der Waal forces are more reactive in that they want to attract, um, in this case, gas to satisfy their imbalance of atomic forces. So the instrument doses nitrogen gas at varying pressures into the sample tube and the surface of the material in the tube attracts that nitrogen gas and covers the surface eventually in a monolayer that is what you're seeing at stage two in that picture. That's where we get surface area measurements. And then as you continue past the monolayer, the molecules fill in the pores on the surface or cavities within the material. And you get further down to what stage four looks like there. And that's where you get porosity measurements. So the apparatus, just how this instrument is actually getting these measurements, there's a nice picture on the right there, but what we do in the lab when we get a sample in is we weigh the sample into a sample analysis tube, and then we record that weight and then dry the whole tube with the sample in it. Um, under nitrogen in the apparatus dry down area and depending the temperature of that depends on the sample itself because we don't want to change any physical characteristics or chemical characteristics of the sample in drying it down we just want to get moisture out um, so usually we just do that overnight and then the next day we cool the sample and tube down and then weigh it back to account for the moisture loss. And then we input that new sample weight into the computer program and then put the sample tube into the manifold and then the tube and manifold are evacuated. Um, the sample tubes are submerged in liquid nitrogen and this has to do with keeping um, conditions at um, ideal conditions temperature wise. That's why it's in liquid nitrogen. And then the instrument doses with nitrogen gas and um, the quantity that's adsorbed is calculated via the universal gas law. And it monitors the pressure until it's stabilized, which indicates Adsorption has equilibrated and the analysis can then go in reverse, which we'll talk about more in a second. So this is what our data actually looks like when it comes off the program. Um, these plots that it makes are plotting pressure versus quantity adsorbed and they're called isotherms. So the software makes these plots for you and the different types of plots you can see are shown there on the right. Um, and you can see in some of those cases you see a, a red line as well as a blue line. Um, and it's actually an indication of when the instrument is at equilibration, it goes in reverse and it takes desorption data points as well. So that's the red line you're seeing. 
and it does that in every isotherm there's just um, a perfect overlay in the, the ones with just the blue line so you wouldn't be able to distinguish that red line um, so these different types of isotherms like I said determine are determined by um, how the material is physically characterized so type 1 2 and 4 are what we see most often um, type 3 and 5 are very rare and then type 6 is a non-porous solid with uniform surface so that's also very rare um, and then on the left there you can see the two most common types of Data reduction equations we use are the BET equation for surface area and the BGH equation for pore size. But there's actually a wide range of data reduction techniques that you can use to um, deduce data in a wide variety of ways, however you want to do that. So let's delve into those most common types of isotherms a little bit more. This type 1 plot you see here is um, pretty basic looking, and this is a microporous material, so less than 2 nanometers of, of pore size. Um, and you can see right where that, that vertical line on the plot is, is where it's starting to equilibrate. Uh, the limiting uptake is governed by the accessible micropore volume rather than by any internal surface area. So um, some normal examples of this would be activated carbons or zeolites is um, things we see pretty commonly. Um, this type 2 isotherm has a kind of primary curve, if you will, and then a secondary curve on its plot um, where that red arrow is at the beginning that's where you go from monolayer to multi-layer adsorption so if you think back to that first picture I showed you with the the atoms on the surface of the material that's where surface area is is a complete measurement and now you're you're going into mono or multi-layer and you're getting into the porosity of porosity measurements of the material. Type 4, um, this is where we see those hysteresis loops on the isotherms. This is due to um, capillary condensation. So you can see in that picture in the middle there, the way that molecules adsorb onto a surface is different than the way that they desorb from a surface. So you can gather that those isotherms will have slightly different plots as they adsorb and desorb, which is where you get that, that loop. So what does this data tell you about your sample? Why do people bring us samples? Why do we care? Um, surface area directly affects the dissolution rate of your sample, uh, electron ion current density, adsorption capacity for things like zeolites, like I was mentioning, uh, surface free energy available for bonding, your pore size distribution also uh, affects diffusion rates, molecular sieving properties, surface area per unit volume, and then the bigger picture, just some more examples of things we commonly see. Adsorbents, so things where your pore size really matters. Carbon granules um, can take up harmful vapors from the environment based on their pore size. Zeolites, in a similar way, take up wastewater contaminants. Nanoparticles have a really high surface to volume ratio. Um, this increases their surface reactivity, so it can even change their toxicity profile just based on how bioavailable they are. Um, if you look at zinc oxide, commercial grade 
has a surface area of like two and a half to 12 meter squared per gram. While compared to nanoparticle zinc oxide, you have surface areas as high as 54 meters squared per gram. So that just shows you um, how much more surface area you're working with when you have a, a nanoparticle or a, a powder versus just a, a commercial grade profile. Um, obviously, more surface area allows for more more types of properties, in this case, superior UV blo blocking properties when compared to bulk material. They use these in sunscreens, um, sil silica nanoparticles used in biomedical applications, drug delivery, cell tracking, gene modification. Uh, we have a regular BET user who's studying nanoparticle films that resemble aerogels. They use these as a thin film for windows that's both transparent and highly insulating. Pore size of the film directly affects transparency and thermal conductivity. Porous carbon um, increases specific capacity rate of performance, and this is used a lot in battery applications.